Gentleman from uh, Indiana, Mr. Fethia. Mr. Chairman, I just must clarify one one thing here, Officer. Um, you said that, your as far as your memory is concerned, you only heard one shot. Yes, sir. That's mm -hmm. all that I can recall. It was a loud one, but that was the only one I. And you were on Houston Street at that time. Yes, sir. As at the <clears throat> somewhere between Main and Elm. And then it's your testimony that after you turned on Elm Street, you heard no further shots? No, sir. Did you see anything in the area of the grassy knoll up and to the right which would be of any interest to this committee? I did see uh, Officer Hargis going up the grassy knoll. Going up the grassy knoll toward the fence, toward the yes, tree sir. area? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Dodd. Well, Chairman, I think I thought we were moving along here. I just wanted to get clarification on these photographs and your identification. In the first photograph here on the left, you identified the, uh, the motorcycle closest to us in the picture as being your motorcycle and, and you are on it. How do you identify yourself there? The way I'm sitting on it, just the way I ride it. When was the last time you saw yourself sitting on a motorcycle? <laughs> it's been a while. But is there anything that distinguishes the on the bike itself that you're able to identify as yourself? No, sir. Will, will the yeah, how do you ride it? I mean, when you say by the way you ride, you ride off to the side, or what, what is it about the letter about the picture that I, distinguishes? I don't know how to explain that. It's just just castric to sitting on it. Look at the last picture, if the gentleman would continue to yield. Mm -hmm. How do you know that's you? Just the way that I'm set. <laughs> I wonder if you just care to describe how you're sitting. It just comes natural to you. <laughs> as, as, as only it should. <laughs> And you don't you don't identify any other mark on that last photograph as being yourself either on the uh, on the motorcycle. No, sir, I can't tell. Let me ask you this: I had asked the acoustical people earlier. Uh, you may have heard the question with regard to the ability for a receiver at the police department to accept uh, transmittals from two or more. Uh, uh, motorcycles or transmitters at the same time. Uh, is that your understanding as well? In other words, if you were in the Dallas Police Department uh, receiving uh, calls, if one person were on that channel transmitting, would it be possible for other uh, people to transmit on that same channel at the same time and also be received uh, by the headquarters? Yes. It could be. They could accept on the same channel more than one transmittal. It, it would be hard to determine what they were saying because they would be overlapping, but the voice would come through. So a lot of times we have the dispatcher to come back and say, there's too many of you talking at one time. All right, were you ever familiar with any clarion bells or, or church bells uh, in the vicinity of Dealey Plaza? No, sir. Has there ever been, to your knowledge, any of those, that kind of sound or noise? No, sir. I right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The time of the gentleman has expired. Any other members seeking recognition? <laughs> Officer McLean at the... I'm sorry. Mr. Cornwell? Hi, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask a clarifying question with respect to the ones the committee members just asked. Officer McLean. When you were asked by the committee a moment ago about how you identify yourself in those two photographs, directing your attention first to the left photograph, number 668, would it be fair to state that the motorcycle you have identified as yourself is the first one behind the two that were right next to the presidential limousine? Yes, sir. And was that the position in which you were riding in the motorcade? Yes, sir. And then directing your attention to number 671 on the right, when you entered Dealey Plaza from Maine on the Houston Street, did you look up ahead to see where the 
presidential and vice presidential limousines were? Yes, sir. What did you see? They were just turning the corner on to Elm Street as I come around the corner off Main Street. So if the photographs here then show that the officer in the photograph enters Houston Street from Maine at the time the presidential limousine is turning from Maine onto Elm, that again would be you because of the position in the motorcade. Yes, sir. Thank you. No further questions. Officer McLean, at the conclusion of a witness's testimony before this committee, the witness is entitled to five minutes. During the five-minute period, he can explain or amplify or in any way comment upon his testimony before this committee. I would extend to you five minutes for that purpose if you so desire. No, sir, I believe we've pretty well covered most of it. Well, on behalf of the committee, we certainly want to thank you for uh, both your cooperation with the staff and with this committee and for the testimony you've given us here today. Thank you very much. Your excuse. In light of the fact that there are several additional witnesses to be heard from by the committee, Chair suggests that we recess for lunch until 2.30 p.m. We begin promptly at that time. Accordingly, we recess to 2.30. So ends this session of the House Assassination Committee, which is holding an all-day special hearing on new scientific evidence in the killing of President Kennedy in Dallas 15 years ago. Evidence suggesting there were four shots, not three, fired in the area of the Kennedy motorcade that tragic November day. The highlight of this first round was the dramatic and detailed testimony of two acoustical experts, um, Mark Weiss and Ernest Ashkenazi, who claimed their testing revealed a 95% probability that a fourth shot was fired. The test consisted of a complicated analysis of the sounds from a police radio microphone that was open at the time of the shooting, the sounds being recorded on tape. Weiss, using charts and diagrams, gave us an elaborate analysis of how he reached the conclusion of a fourth bullet all involving the position of the motorcycle from which the police broadcast came, the type of sound that was recorded, the, ec the echoes that produced electronic impulses, even the temperature at the time and the architecture of the nearby buildings. From all of this, Weiss said, uh, there was an assumption made that a fourth shot was fired from the grassy knoll along Dealey Plaza where the motorcade was proceeding. There also was an assumption the shot was fired at the motorcade, although he was not certain of the precise target. In other words, he could draw no conclusion that a fourth bullet actually did strike President Kennedy. Uh, as a matter of fact, he said that it could have landed in front of the motorcade or behind the motorcade. Some committee members plainly were not convinced by this testimony, but Weiss and Ashkenazi uh, stuck, stuck very strongly to their interpretation. And finally, uh, just a few moments ago, we heard Officer H.B. McLean, the Dallas police officer whose police radio apparently was involved. He told his story of the events that day in Dallas, November 22, 1963. Uh, with me to uh, discuss what we've heard are... Um, are the gentlemen who've been sitting in all day, Carl Oglesby of the Private Outside Study Group, the Assassination Information Bureau, and Jeremiah O'Leary, who has spent many years covering the Kennedy killing for the Washington Star. Gentlemen, I think whether one agrees or disagrees with the expert testimony that was given this morning, it was certainly impressively presented. Well, it was impressively presented, but Representative Bob Edgar of Pennsylvania said that it appeared to be a, a very uh, sophisticated presentation of a test tube experiment. And my overall impression was that, that there is considerably more than little skepticism by the six Democrats and one Republican who are asking the questions today. Some of the questions they raised were not, to my view, satisfactorily answered. How, for example, do Dr. Weiss and Ashkenazi come up with a 95% certainty of shot number three from the grassy knoll when uh, Dr. Barger, who testified in September, 
uh, concluded there was only a 50-50 chance when the two new acoustical scientists were using Barger's basic material. Didn't they say that they had a chance to go beyond, through their experiments, to go beyond uh, Barger's uh, experimentation? They did, but they also said that they made assumptions at the outset. A, that the first shot came from the, that the shot that interests them the most came from the grassy knoll, and uh, that the motorcycle was within a very finite area uh, behind the president's car where the sounds that we've been talking about all day uh, were, were uh, broadcast to police headquarters and put on tape. You know, Jerry oh, mentions, uh, yeah, sorry, Jerry, I was just going to say, Jerry mentions there is a, a higher level of skepticism on the committee's part uh, exhibited toward these witnesses. But uh, surely that's appropriate, isn't it? And uh, hadn't we ought to say it's too bad we didn't see some of the skepticism uh, with respect to some of the other witnesses on the, on the no conspiracy side of the case? For example, the examination of Dr. Humes, uh, which uh, was so mild and incomplete as virtually not to have taken place. Now, who was Dr. Uh, Humes? Dr. Humes, James Humes, testified uh, back in September on crucial points of the medical testimony. What was, was his in, principal finding? Uh, Humes was uh, one of the original examining uh, pathologists at Bethesda, and his testimony as to what he saw in the, in the, in the president's wounds has always been at variance with uh, what panels have found who studied the, the evidence in the, in the National Archives. How did you regard this testimony this morning? Well, it's explosive. There's no question about it, and as uh, one who has been associated with the criticism of the Warren Commission finding for a long time, I can't help but feel some satisfaction in it, although I remember Lao Tzu's injunction that we should conduct our triumphs as funerals. There is, in a larger sense, everything to be awed at and frightened by in the implications of this testimony. We're still left with that basic uh, fact that nobody was seen running away from the grassy knoll uh, toting a rifle at the time, and uh, some of the committee members took note of that, and I think, Jerry, that, uh, when, uh, that when we refer to the skepticism, that very much is a, is a point that the committee members have to live with. Uh, part of the skepticism may also be due to the disclosure, which is new to me, that, that uh, acoustical engineering uh, is not an arcane art. Uh, these two witnesses both testified that uh, they use the elemental principles of physics and geometry that they used pieces of string, uh, that they used simple, simple calculators, and uh, that their process was not, it sounds complicated, but in the last analysis, they used the tools that high school children had. Well, this winds up the first phase of our coverage of this special hearing by the House Assassinations Committee. We'll be back when the hearing resumes in about 45 minutes at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time on most of these same PBS stations. I'm Paul Duke in Washington. This program was produced by WETA, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Ford Foundation. <laughs> This is the old House caucus room on Capitol Hill in Washington, the scene of a special hearing being held today by the Congressional Committee investigating the assassinations of President John Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Good afternoon. I'm Paul Duke inside the hearing room where in just a few minutes we'll hear more testimony relating to new scientific evidence in the death of John Kennedy. The evidence is an outgrowth of some refined acoustical tests of the sounds in Dallas that fateful November day when Kennedy was shot down. We heard witnesses say this morning that four shots were fired, not three experts have repeatedly said over the past 15 years. If true, this would reinforce the view of those who contend there was a conspiracy in the killing, that Lee Harvey Oswald did not act alone, that in fact another gunman took part in the assassination, shooting from a grassy knoll near the Kennedy motorcade 
as it proceeded through Dealey Plaza in downtown Dallas. The Warren, uh, the Warren Commission, which conducted the government's original investigation into the slaying more than a decade ago, concluded that three shots were fired, all from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building. But in today's first round, the men who have come up with this new evidence, Mark Weiss and Ernest Ashkenazi of Queens College in New York, said there was a 95% probability that a fourth shot was fired. Well, here with us to help us help you understand what's going on, we have Carl Oglesby from the Assassination Information Bureau, a private research group which has been looking into the, into the killings of John Kennedy and Martin Luther King for a long time, and Jeremiah O'Leary, who has long covered the assassination story for the Washington, story, for the Washington Star. Quite clearly, gentlemen, what is raised by the testimony this morning by the two acoustical experts is again the specter or the very real possibility that there was some kind of conspiracy. Yes, indeed. There's uh, actually only one way that the tape could be authentic, and its apparent results, the real results, the real accounting of what happened, and there, and there would still be no conspiracy. And that would be the case in which we had two lone gunmen also, at the, two lone gunmen at the same time in Dealey Plaza, where we had Oswald in his perch and the other guy on the grassy knoll, whose name no one knows, uh, just by coincidence, uh, coming together at that time, but without any awareness of each other. And unless we can accept that as a plausible theory, uh, we've got a conspiracy. We've got immediate, direct, solid, concrete, uh, prima facie evidence that a conspiracy was afoot. Even though there is no smoking gun, as it were, and we have no evidence that, that any uh, policeman yeah. uh, or anyone else, for that matter, saw anyone running away from the Grassy Knoll area. Well, you and know, even though the FBI has talked a great deal with, yeah. uh, with people who were in that area, I think we should point out that the tape to which you referred, Carl, was the tape from the police radio. The officer who presumably uh, used the radio on his motorcycle at the time of the Kennedy motorcade was one of the witnesses this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, just on a connection of uh, the smoking gun and, uh, and the possibilities of people having seen someone who might have been the holder of the smoking gun, we have to remember uh, that there is this little interlude with a with a phony Secret Service man that one of the Dallas police officers uh, uh, ran into right after the shooting. He ran to the area behind the grassy knoll and confronted somebody who said he was a Secret Service man. It turned out there were no Secret Service people there. I think we have to say, Jerry, that, uh, that a number of members of the committee were quite skeptical of the, of the testimony that was given this morning, and whereas they regarded it as uh, as scientific in a rather pure sense, they didn't necessarily buy it. I agree with you. Uh, I couldn't begin to say how they will vote tonight or even if we'll know the results. Of, uh, how now, would you say vote tonight? I think we should explain that the committee, after the open session today, is going to meet in executive session, a session that we cannot possibly cover. But at that time, they apparently are going to approve their conclusions. Whether they will be reached, we just don't know. Yes, uh, we don't know if that'll be very late, and we don't know if they'll release their findings on both the Kennedy and the King case uh, uh, early or late. But uh, it seems to me uh, that A, the shot from the grassy knoll is far from proven, uh, and secondly, uh, it is still that large leap from two different people shooting at the same time to proof of a conspiracy which, uh, which, as far as I know, after 15 years of covering this story, there is no, is no concrete proof. The closest thing to it is the possibility that two men from two different places might have fired shots at the same time. Well, speaking of, of proof and, uh, and whether there was a conspiracy, I'd like to turn now to one of the committee members because we were just talking a moment ago and suggesting that there was a certain skepticism that was evident this morning. With me is Congressman Richardson Pryor, a Democrat from North Carolina, who is the vice chairman of the committee. Uh, what is your assessment of what we heard this morning from mm -hmm. the acoustical experts, Mr. Pryor? 
Well, I think that the committee was skeptical, as you say. I was skeptical at the outset about uh, a new form of scientific evidence, which I hadn't heard much about before. I asked one question, which I hope to follow up with Dr. Barger this afternoon, as to whether this sort of evidence has ever been admitted in a courtroom, for example, whether it's received the legal uh, imprimatur of respectability. I must say that testimony was quite impressive to me in that it, it seemed to depend on simple principles of mathematics, common sense, and not on any uh, interpretation of evidence or, or uh, subjective factors. So that I think the evidence is pretty strong, which would tend to show two shooters. I overheard the last part of your conversation with Mr. O'Leary. Uh, if you have two people shooting, and the evidence on that, there's not an awful lot of evidence to corroborate that, as he said, but that the next question is, does that make it a conspiracy? And I think one of the interesting questions involved here is, it could be a, a conspiracy of two nuts, to put it bluntly, rather than a conspiracy of a political nature, which we usually tend to think of when we say conspiracy. That is, we think uh, whether there are Russians behind it or organized crime or something of that sort. Uh, it doesn't look like it's uh, any sort of a political conspiracy of that sort. It's going to be an interesting question of law if all you have is this evidence, scientific evidence, saying uh, there was a second shooter and nothing else to corroborate it. Is that enough evidence to prove a conspiracy or to go to the jury on the question? And as a matter of law, it's interesting that the state court law in most states would say, no, that's not enough evidence to go to the jury because your circumstantial evidence has to be inconsistent with any other hypothesis, is the way they put it. That would be consistent with the, uh, it would not be inconsistent with the hypothesis of coincidence. Maybe it was just a coincidence that two people fired at the same time, not a conspiracy. But in the federal courts, it would go to the jury. Let me ask you this question then. If indeed you feel that there is, that that what we heard this morning constitutes insufficient evidence under the law, what does this do to the committee's investigation? Because you are going to meet later in the evening. Presumably at that time you will vote and then make your conclusions about your long investigation into the death of President Kennedy. What are you now going to do? Well, first I would say that we would probably follow the federal court rule which would say this is enough evidence from which you could uh, infer a conspiracy. You will and that, say that. Um, that is just my guess. But I would think that if you say, is it a coincidence or is it a conspiracy, uh, common sense, I think, uh, helps load it on the side of a conspiracy. It seems an extraordinary coincidence uh, that two people were there firing at the same time with the president, entirely separate from each other. But then that gets into the question you ask, uh, if it is a conspiracy, uh, who is involved and does that change all of our report? Our report originally had spent a great deal of time on the subject of conspiracy. And I think on that we will be dealing with the five major areas, was it uh, the Soviet Union, was it Cuba, was it organized crime, was it CIA and FBI, uh, was it the anti-Castro or pro-Castro Cuban groups? And I think we're going to make recommendations on that, uh, which will probably leave, probably will uh, find most of those large groups innocent of any sort of complicity, but might leave open a, a narrow window of some individuals within, say, organized crime or within those groups that well, would be involved. Fire, you don't have to accept, I don't suppose, the findings of the acoustics experts, uh, so long as you refer to it 
in your final report, but don't you also have the prerogative of sending the entire committee report to the Justice Department yeah. for follow-up and prosecution of anyone who may be found culpable? Yes, uh, right. And I would think that all of the matters that we haven't been able to resolve, and unfortunately this did come in at the last minute, we will refer it to probably a particular uh, aspect of the Justice Department to follow up on. Does it trouble you at all that some of the evidence that these uh, scientists produced today uh, is based on what one member called test tube analysis in New York, which is quite a distance removed from, from Dallas and where however close a facsimile of Dallas they selected, uh, that the acoustical conditions might not have been the same? Well, I think that was evidence um, not necessarily relating to the time of echoes and that sort of thing at Dallas, but was related to whether the microphone and whether the uh, motorcycle would present certain curves because of the windshield effect and so forth. Um, I would have to agree with you that from, from a courtroom point of view, a lot of that match wouldn't be uh, accepted as uh, being very exact. It seems to me they made some assumptions. One, that there was a shot from the grassy knoll. Two, that the motorcycle was in a certain position. And starting with those two <coughs> quantities as, uh, as uh, chiseled in stone, they then everything else was made to fit. Uh, that seemed to me to be to be slightly mm -hmm. troublesome to at least some of the committee. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think this group <clears throat> started with that assumption to make it fit, uh, because Dr. Varga had uh, pointed in that general direction, and so they narrowed in on it. But I think the key question is, does it fit? and does it only fit that one particular set of circumstances? Don't we come back to a fundamental point, Congressman Fryer, that everything we've heard today and everything which the committee has discovered, learned during this long investigation, adds up to the fact that, that, that there are more doubts than ever now about what really did happen in Dallas. Well, I think it has opened up uh, the conspiracy question, which we thought uh, looked as if we were going to close that. Right. Uh, so in that sense, it has opened some other questions. I think when you see our final report, we will have narrowed that down quite a bit because we will have excluded uh, possible involvement in conspiracies in a number of groups. Thanks very much, Congressman Pryor. We'll let Thank you go you, back and do your work now. <laughs> well, I think we're ready to go back. All right. Well, this afternoon, um, as Congressman Pryor just suggested a moment ago, we will hear another acoustical expert, Dr. James Barger, who had testified earlier during another phase of the committee's uh, hearings. And he had suggested that there was a 50% possibility uh, that a fourth bullet was involved. But the gavel has been sounded, and now we go back to Chairman Stokes. Chair recognizes Professor Blakey. Mr. Chairman, I might initially note for the record that the temperature that was employed in the acoustics project was obtained from the Environmental Data and Information Service at the National Climactic Center, Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, the temperature at Love Field, Dallas, Texas, on November the 22nd, 1963, was 63 degrees at noon and 67 degrees at 1 p.m. The skies were clear. Uh, this is, of course, the weather service data, which would be the most accurate. In addition, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have Mark as JFK Exhibit 683 and F682, two photographs taken in Dealey Plaza. JFK Exhibit 6F683 F683 is a photograph that includes the Texas Book Depository, which had on the top of it a time and temperature sign. And the time shown on the, the, the sign is 1240. 
you can see from the picture itself that JFK exhibit F682 was taken moments thereafter. The same people are in the, uh, uh, the, the picture. And that indicates that the temperature uh, in Dealey Plaza at approximately 1240 was 66. It was in this context that the staff uh, recommended to the uh, acoustics people that they take a temperature of 65, which would seem to be approximately uh, within the range of, of what would be appropriate. Mr. Chairman, I would ask that JFK exhibit uh, F682 and F683 be incorporated in the record at this point. Without objection, they may be entered to the record at this point. As previously noted, the committee originally retained the services of both Baranek and Newman to conduct its acoustics project. Dr. James Barger, the, chief's, the firm's chief scientist and a man in charge of the acoustical analysis at Bolt, Baranek and Newman, conducted the test for the committee. Dr. Barger received a BS in mechanical engineering from the University of Michigan in 1957 an MS in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Connecticut in 1960, and an AM in Applied Physics from Harvard University in 1962. In 1964, he received a PhD in Applied Physics from Harvard University. He has been a sonar project officer at the U.S. Naval Underwater Sound Laboratory, a research assistant at Harvard University's Acoustical Research Laboratory, and senior scientist and director of the physical science division at Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. Dr. Barger is the author of many scientific papers. He has lectured in the field of applied acoustics in the United States and Canada, and is currently a lecturer on sound scattering and reverberations with Bolt, Baranek, and Newman's anti-submarine warfare course. He has been a National Science Foundation fellow and he is currently a fellow of the Acoustical Society of America. He is also a member of the U.S. Naval Advisory Board for Underwater Sound Reference Services. In recent years, Dr. Barger has worked as an analysis of sound recordings in two quite celebrated cases, the shooting ex ex situation at Kent State University, for which he studied recorded sounds of gunfire and the White House tapes in the Watergate case. He helped analyze the mysterious 18-minute gap as a member of the panel headed by Dr. Richard Bolt, who is himself the head of Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. It would be appropriate at this time, Mr. Chairman, to recall Dr. Barger. The committee recalls Dr. <coughs> Barger. Doctor, you have previously been sworn in, this, uh, in these hearings, and I would at this time admonish you that you are <coughs> still under that that oath. You understand that, of course? Yes, I do. Thank you. Chair recognizes counsel for the committee, Mr. Jim Wolf. Welcome back, Dr. Parker. Uh, you last testified in great detail before this committee in public session on September 11, 1978. And today I would merely like to review briefly some of the points you made during that testimony and then ask you to comment upon the testimony that we heard this morning from Professors Weiss and Ashkenazi. Prior to that, though, in reference to the work you did on the Kent State tapes that <coughs> Professor Blakey made reference to in his narration, is it correct that in your work on that tape recording, you determined both the location of the shooters and the timing of the shooters from an acoustical analysis and that your determination of both location and timing of shooters was subsequently stipulated to be correct and admitted into evidence in a court case. When were you first approached by this committee with the Dallas Police Dispatch Tape? I believe it was in May of 1978. And am I correct that after a review of that tape and your filtering of that tape and a series of tests upon that tape, you eventually recommended to the committee that it conduct a reenactment in Dallas, which would entail shooting at target locations 
while you recorded those sounds on microphones. Yes, that's correct. And when was that reenactment conducted for the committee? August 20th. I would now ask Mr. Chairman that JFK Exhibit 337 be displayed and inserted into the record at this time. Without objection, it may be entered into the record at this point. This exhibit is a diagram of Daly Plaza and the microphone locations that were used during the reenactment test. Dr. Bardra, I'll ask you to briefly explain what the numbers one, two, three, and four are on that exhibit. Yes. Uh, numbers one, two, three, and four, which appear in the boxes here, represent the location of the sandbag targets that were placed on the street as targets for the uh, gunfire. And the numbers one through 12 that appear uh, on the street, what do those numbers represent? I believe there are three sequences of them. Yes, there are three sequences, one through 12. Each of these sequences represents the position of 12 microphones that were placed in those three groups of 12 to receive the sounds of the gunfire that were uh, fired. And during that test firing, what were the two locations used to fire weapons from? Uh, weapons were fired from the sixth floor corner window, uh, southeast corner of the Texas School Book Depository, and from behind the fence on the knoll at this point. And were weapons fired from each location at each of the targets? Uh, that is correct. Uh, rifles from the Texas School Book Depository were fired at each of the four uh, targets. A rifle from the knoll was fired at each of the four targets, I'm sorry, at targets number two, three, and five. Uh, we did not fire at target one for safety reasons. A, uh, in, in addition, a pistol was fired from the knoll position here at target location number three. And during those test firings, you recorded through those microphones the sounds of those test firings? That is correct. Mr. Chairman, at this point, I would like JFK Exhibit uh, 367 to be displayed and inserted into the record. This exhibit, Dr. Barger, does it represent, as a result of your matching the recordings you achieved during the Dallas reenactment, those recordings that matched the original Dallas police dispatch tape with a correlation coefficient of at least 0.5? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, I, I wish at this time I could say a few words about the stark simplicity of the matching procedure that was used. Surely. Uh, if I may briefly to clarify this exhibit, since it came after three hours of explanation the last time. <laughs> there were obtained at each of these microphones the series of echoes that were received by them when each of these rifles was fired. And it was suggested the last time that I spoke that these might be likened to fingerprints, and that's not just a bad idea. There is a pattern of sounds that emanate from each microphone when each rifle is fired that is unique. And that pattern is as if a fingerprint that identifies two things uniquely, the location of the rifle and the location of the receiver. Now, obtained on the Dallas police recording that we discussed this morning, were the sounds of impulses, segment, segments of impulses, that looked like fingerprints too. They were badly smudged by the presence of noise. We sought to match the fingerprints that we measured in our reconstruction with the fingerprints that had been recorded, uh, perhaps by Officer McLean in uh, 1963. And we did that matching. We did it in a numerical way. 
the numerical procedure allowed us to score each match. Now we had 432 different combinations of rifle shots and microphones, so we had 432 fingerprints, as from 432 individuals. And we wish to see if any of those individuals were on the tape recording, as recorded by Officer McLean, perhaps. And so we matched each of the 432 fingerprints with each of the uh, microphone, uh, that is, with each of six patterns of impulses that were on the Dallas tape to see if any of them matched at all. And we had a scoring procedure. Every time the match was so good that the score was higher than 0.5, we said that's a very likely match. That individual may exist at that place on the tape. And now I can explain what this <laughs> and when was that matching started, process completed? Uh, thank you. Uh, it turned out there were 2,592 matches to achieve, and each one was somewhat difficult because of the smudging of the fingerprints. And uh, in so far or since, the uh, fingerprints were only obtained on the 20th of August. It wasn't until the 6th of September that each of the 2,592 uh, comparisons had been made. Now, that was four days before the hearing, Given that it takes one day to prepare for one day's testimony, we had three days to wrestle with the fact that there were, in fact, four possible matches of yeah. fingerprints identified in the Dallas tape. And at the time uh, that I spoke on the 20th of August, uh, I indicated that of the six segments on the Dallas police <laughs> recording that contained any echo, uh, any um, impulse patterns at all, in other words, potential fingerprints. The first one began at this time, and we found no scores matching with any of these test shots higher than 0.5. However, a short time later, about a second and a half later, there was a series of uh, sound impulses on the Dallas tape, which in fact scored above my threshold of 0.5 to be considered as a potential detection of a fingerprint. A fingerprint is a rifle fired from a given place and received at a given other place. Uh, in the case of the first time where we indicated any shots may have been in fact fired and contained on the Dallas police recording, we found that when the rifle was located in the Texas School Book Depository and fired, which is here, and fired at uh, target one, which is here, we passed our threshold, we got a score, a matching, a fingerprint score that was higher than 0.5. For the microphone located in the second array, microphone five, that, that one right there. So yeah. Dr. Barger, on JFK exhibit 337, I believe last time you testified on September 11th, you marked in um, colored pencil with blue, red, green, and black the approximate correlations between the location of the microphone that picked up the impulse and the location of the motorcycle if it were traveling in the motorcade. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And how precise are your locations of the motorcycle of those blue, green, red, and black dots? I won't, I'll try not to belabor this point, but at the time that this experiment was designed, we did not know whether the motorcycle was in Dealey Plaza, and we didn't certainly know where along this entire path it was. And so it was necessary to sample four fingerprints, as it were, at every 18-foot interval. The process thus designed turned out to be capable of locating in fact, shots by the fingerprint method that I've been describing. However, it could not do it in space any more accurately than the distance between two adjacent microphones. In other words, I could only locate the possible location of that motorcycle at each time that the fingerprint was possibly found on the Dallas tape to within 18 feet. So, for, for example, Dr. Barger, the blue dot that you put on that diagram it's possible that that blue dot, in fact, would be on the other side of the location of that microphone. The blue dot that I put 
to show the approximate location of the motorcycle at the time on the Dallas tape that the first possible match was determined, uh, I placed between microphone five and six. It could equally have well been placed between microphones four and five, which would have put it there. And those four groupings that you have are the four impulses on the Dallas police dispatch tape that you identified during the hearing in September as possibly being representative of gunfire in Daly Plaza. Is that correct? That's correct. I subsequently indicated that there were four other times on the Dallas police tape at which our matching process had, had indicated the possibility of a shot. In other words, a match between the test shots and the impulses on the tape by this fingerprint process. And, these, and the location of the microphone that was picking up these sounds on the Dallas police tape, in other words, the location of presumably Officer McLean's uh, motorcycle, could be positioned then as being within 18 feet of the, of the microphone that indicated that's where the match occurred. And of course, uh, since the subsequent shots were fired later on in time, I was able to indicate that the motorcycle was approximately here at the time of the first shot and here at the time of the second and here at the time of the third if in fact it were to prove to be a shot and here at uh, the time of the fourth. Does your predictions of the locations of the motorcycle correspond to the testimony given by Officer McLean this morning? Yes, in judgment, in my judgment, it uh, certainly does. The uh, uh, officer was able to remember I, I was very pleased to hear that when he was around the corner uh, from Maine onto Houston, he could see the presidential lim uh, limousine disappearing around the corner here uh, from Houston onto Elm. That distance would be on the order of 180 feet. Uh, so he would have been uh, somewhere but around 180 feet, perhaps a little less, from the presidential motorcade at that time. I mean, from the presidential limousine at that time. Uh, now, the distance from where we think that he was at the time of the first shot, which is here, to the distance where the presidential uh, limousine was at the time of the first shot, is about somewhere between 120 and 138 feet. Again, this 18 feet uncertainty. Um, which uh, is, okay, I just said that the, uh, we have located with our acoustic analysis the, 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 the uh, result that the motorcycle was 120 to 138 feet behind the limousine at the time of the first shot, which is right about here. Uh, Officer McLean remembers having been about 100 and uh, 80 to 60 to 80 feet behind at this time. He would have therefore had to close a little gap, you know, had, had to gain a bit on the presidential limousine as he came down Houston. And that now, might be expected if the presidential limousine was slowing as it went around the that turn? That would, of course, naturally happen in this accordion fashion that he described. As the presidential limousine slowed to go around here, he would catch up with it. And one of the first points that I made when we were analyzing the sounds of the tape from that motorcycle was that its speed had remained high until just before the first shot was in fact heard, detected, and of course you would have to slow at that point to negotiate that corner. Thank you. you may return to the witness table, Dr. Barger. Thank you. At this point, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that we mark as JFK Exhibit 680 a report that has been submitted to the committee by Mr. Anthony Pelicano. Mr. Pelicano is an independent and investigator who submitted a report to the committee after Dr. Barger's testimony in September. Mr. Pelicano has never worked for the committee or been affiliated with the committee in any capacity. Dr. Barger, have you had an opportunity to review the report submitted by Mr. Pelicano? I have read it. I would like to read parts of this report to you and ask you to comment upon them. Uh, Mr. Pelocano characterizes his work as a deduction from your testimony applying some independent investigation of his own. The first portion I'd like to read is on page four. I'll read the paragraph and then ask you to comment. It says, the first significant finding involving the sound of the motorcycle sirens on the Channel One tape. 
If the motorcycle with the open microphone had been with the motorcade, it would have been expected that the siren sound would have started at full volume, and if the motorcycle had continued with the motorcade, would have continued for the trip to Parkland Hospital. On the other hand, if the motorcycle had remained at Daly Plaza, the sounds would have started at full volume, and the volume would have decreased as the motorcade pulled away. The sounds of the siren on the tape, however, seem to increase, peak, and decrease, as if they were approaching, passing, and leaving the open microphone position. While this observation is admittedly somewhat subjective, if true, it would indicate that the motorcycle was not with the motorcade, but was at some point along or near the route taken by the mo motorcade on its way to Parkland Hospital. Unquote. Could you comment upon that, please? I can't remember all that, <laughs> but... Um... While I was still uh, focusing on what you were saying, the um, statement was made that it would be expected that the motorcycle radio uh, that we have placed in the motorcade would pick up the sound of the siren on the chief's car that would presumably have been turned on just after the shooting. I, I think I heard that. Is that? That's correct. <laughs> uh, the chief's car was in front of the presidential limousine and would have been at this time uh, at the underpass or just beyond a distance of at least 300 feet from the position of the motorcycle as we have placed it. Now, the sound of a motor of a siren uh, 300 feet away from a running motorcycle uh, with as much background noise as there was in the plaza at that time would not have been audible in other words i would disagree with the assumption that it could be heard uh, a little simple arithmetic indicates uh, since the source level of sirens is around 120 decibels and the transmission loss from uh, that particular uh, chief of police car to the motorcycle would have to be at least 40 decibels. The sound pressure level of the siren at the position of the motorcycle could not have exceeded about 80 decibels. But we have seen that the uh, insensitive direction of the motorcycle microphone, it being a directional microphone and not being sensitive to sounds from the front, uh, was pointed at the chief's car, and so that received sound level of 80 decibels would be considerably less than the ambient noise level in the microphone at that time, which was 90 decibels, and also would have been coming in on the insensitive axis of the microphone. So I don't believe that that assumption that you would hear this siren is true. That so wasn't a very short answer, but... So therefore, you would also disagree with the statement that since the sound of the sirens occurs somewhere uh, in the vicinity of 12.33, two or three minutes after the presumed shots, Mr. Pelicano's deduction that therefore the motorcycle could not have been in Daly Plaza. You would disagree with that deduction? Yes. I'd like now to read from page 14 of the submission to the committee and ask you to comment upon this statement, it concerns a question I believe Congressman Dodd in part addressed this morning about the ringing of a bell that appears on the tape. The report states, quote, the sound of the bell on the Channel One tape requires that a bell be located within an acoustical range of the open microphone. There was no such bell in or near Daly Plaza. While it has not been identified as the same bell, there was a bell in the tower of the Lucas Baptist Church 4435 Rosewood, near the intersection of Lucas and Rosewood, Dallas, Texas, located 0.6 miles from the position of the designation of a three-wheel motorcycle on traffic control duty on the Stemmons overpass over Industrial Boulevard. Could you comment upon that passage? The uh, sound of the bell uh, occurred a few seconds after the time of the fourth shot, I don't remember exactly when, uh, it indicates that there was a transmitter 
on a motorcycle or perhaps in a squad car or possibly also a walkie-talkie, but a transmitter that was transmitting a little after the fourth shot that was within sound range, audible range, of a bell. Uh, I agree completely with Officer McLean's statement that uh, more than one transmitter can be uh, can share a receiver at one time. This is true whenever the uh, strength of the carriers of all of the radios in question are within the capture ratio of the receiver in their intensity. Thank you, Dr. Barger. I'd now like to address the testimony Professors Weiss and Ashkenazi gave this committee this morning. Have you had an opportunity to review the work of Professors Weiss and Ashkenazi? Yes, I have. And what did you do to independently review their work that was done for this committee? In the first place, uh, shortly after uh, my testimony at the previous hearing, I met with Professor Weiss and Mr. Ashkenazi and members of the uh, committee staff to discuss how best we might uh, reduce the uncertainty in the results uh, that uh, we had obtained at that time, uh, in particular relating to the uh, possibility of the third shot, which is listed in green in that, ex in that uh, exhibit. And we contributed in that discussion to the concept of an analytical extension of our work, which is, in fact, the analytical extension that they can carried out. So we were familiar with the parameters that they would need to know and also with the procedure that they intended to follow. And I asked them what parameters they were using and found in each case that I agreed with them. In other words, we checked their procedures and the parameters that they used. Um, in addition, and perhaps um, m most importantly, uh, at the stage where they had finished with all their strings, as they were illustrating this morning, and had identified the echo-producing objects in the plaza that caused the uh, echoes at positions near microphone four there, that where we found it might, the shot may have occurred, and where it may have been received. Uh, we, we looked at those echo-producing objects for that location that they found with their very uh, accurate and diligent procedure and made a judgment about each one as to whether it would be able to produce an echo of sufficient strength to be heard in the re uh, motorcycle microphone considering the direction from which it had to arrive at the motorcycle microphone considering that we now know the direction the microphone was pointing at that time. And we found that the echo producing objects that they identified were reasonable and would in fact produce echoes of sufficient strength to be seen or heard, I should say. In your testimony on September 11th, addressing particularly the third impulse in the Dallas police dispatch tape, you stated that the probability of this being a shot from the grassy knoll was 50-50. Professor Weiss and Ashkenazi today, whose testimony you heard, stated that the probability of this being a shot from the grassy knoll was 95% or